With the start of a new year, we're taking time tonight to look back at the year that was in Canadian weather and what a year 2023 was. We begin with John Hua and a look at the record-setting wildfires. As images of wildfire flashed from coast to coast, Whoa. stoking the fears of entire communities. Like you feel you're into revelations in the Bible. It was easy to feel like the whole country was going up in flames. Oh, it's been long. For countless people, the place they called home was on the edge of destruction. Just grabbing everything and wondering where to go. In BC, it was the perfect convergence of conditions to set the stage for the most destructive wildfire season in history. Drought, lightning strikes and high winds creating a sense of dread. People thought their town was gone. Global BC reporter Ramina Dea and camera operator Justin O'Kynes on the ground. The evacuation order still stands. And in the air as a raging inferno threatened the entire town of Tumbler Ridge in June. You realize how small you are up against this power. There's no amount of water bombing that's going to win that battle when the winds kick up. More than 2,400 people evacuated, desperate for answers, drawn to Global News for the latest information on and off camera. They were coming up to us and wanting to talk and wanting to ask questions. Lots of hugs, lots of tears. Thanks to some much needed rain and favorable winds, the residents of Tumbler Ridge were eventually able to return home. But the wildfire season in British Columbia was far from over. It was like fighting a hundred years worth of fire all at once. Less than a month later, hellfire was waiting to be unleashed on BC's interior. Not even the massive Okanagan Lake could contain it, embers sailing across the water, proving no one was safe. I at one point couldn't see how we didn't lose lives. The very present danger of the McDougal Creek wildfire also triggering past trauma. For many residents who witnessed fire rip through their community, two decades ago. You just sit on edge and you're wondering with anxiety, is your house going to burn? It was Cassidy Moscone's first call to the wildfires after joining Global BC. Right now have been looking all night at these terrifying, almost hellish scenes. The sense of terror gripping tens of thousands will be forever seared in her memory. They were yelling at us. They were like, get out. Do you know what's happening? Get out. Um, and I think that was when, because everyone was watching the fire from the lake. Veteran camera operator Pat Bell always fighting for the best vantage point. Among the first to confirm homes in West Kelowna were being consumed by fire. Well, nobody's reported that officially from BC Wildfire. I said, up, I put the camera and put the Tejero on and said, you look, you can see houses burning. Nearly 200 homes in the central Okanagan were either damaged or completely destroyed. That was like an extremely powerful moment, actually seeing what had gone and, and where did it go. It was homes were reduced to nothing. It was just dust. While the threat of wildfire has become common in certain regions across Canada, seeing the smoke rise so early in the year came with a suffocating realization of what could be next. I remember saying that this is just a disaster waiting to happen. Everything was, was a matchstick. In early May, the prairies became prey. Residents of Alberta's Drayton Valley forced to watch everything they worked so hard for become fire fuel. We've lost our entire farm, <laughs> all our livestock, our whole life. Every time they would get the flames doused and they thought they were through the worst of it, these flames would return. On the other side of the country in Nova Scotia, the community of Tentalan was being terrorized by flames. You're torn between wanting to approach them, but also know that they have no idea where they're going to sleep tonight. You can see the darkness from the smoke. The wildfire emergency reaching a whole new level in mid-August, with the capital city of the Northwest Territories in crisis mode. Well, this is the line to the registration center where people can sign out for a flight out of Yellowknife. 20,000 people were told to flee the city. For some, the airport was the only way out. The manager of the airport authority actually burst into tears because he was just so overwhelmed with how his staff had pitched in and so utterly exhausted. In smaller areas like the hamlet of Enterprise, residents tired of waiting for help, taking action. There's nobody here. We're the only ones here. 
we broke into the fire department, the fire hall, and we stole the fire truck and the water truck from there. I live in a national park surrounded by old growth forests that are primed to burn. So I was thinking about my own <laughs> preparedness, my family's own preparedness. No matter where in the country, in the face of such a ruthless wildfire season, from the ashes rose countless stories of resilience. It's not really till later that night where we're back at the hotel watching the story on TV where it really kind of like has more time to kind of wash over you and, and realize like this is not normal. Oh, you know, just living. Near the end of the summer, back in BC, shoe swap residents faced with the bittersweet reality that even survival might offer little respite. That moment of relief, and then that's just followed up by you know, the sadness and what is my neighborhood even like anymore. Ours in that greenhouse beside us is gone. And in West Kelowna, when the smoke dissipated, the utter devastation was revealed. While little comfort could be found, at least a clear picture of their loss could be seen through a global news camera. That was our retirement home. All we had was there. This year's devastating wildfire season serving as a vivid reminder that this is becoming the new normal. John Hua, Global News, Vancouver. It was the spring storm no one really expected. On Wednesday, April 5th, freezing rain fell in Quebec for hours. The day unraveled quickly. Once you get into the month of April, you think that you're home free. You're not going to get a big ice storm or even snowstorms that linger. But uh, this year was different. By mid-afternoon, the consequences started to be felt with power failures reported all over the province <coughs> as trees and branches heavy with ice started to fall. Towards evening, like 7 o'clock nighttime, it was just like a war zone. Trees, branches were cracking and falling. It was like everywhere. Loud. Loud, very loud. Sounds like gunshots almost. The rain left a thick layer of ice basically on everything. The problem was weight. Every branch was heavier and not all of them could take it. What made matters worse for some people was that the storm affected towers in certain areas, meaning people weren't able to use their cell phones to communicate or access the internet. I can't contact anybody, not my parents, not my friends, nobody. And that left people frantically searching for stores that were open to plug in their devices and places to keep warm. At the peak of the storm, 1.1 million Quebecers lost power. The province's public utility, Hydro-Quebec, had over 1,500 employees on the ground working on larger outages first, then moving to the smaller ones. The western part of Montreal was one of the hardest hit areas and people here, like my own family, waited the longest for the power to come back. I remember spending a few cold nights at home with my husband and two toddlers trying to stay warm. And then came Monday morning, five days after the storm, and still we had no power. So I reported on my own neighborhood. Things look and also feel pretty different in this part of Kirkland. The Montreal suburban town was one of the many areas hit hard by Wednesday's ice storm and parts of it are still in the dark. To sleep in your ski, ski wear, uh, not yeah. so funny. It took about a week or so after the storm for the public utility to restore power to all of its clients. After that, questions began to swirl about the fragility of Hydro's network and what could be done to prevent future outages. Michael Sabia says his plan is an ambitious but realistic one. At the end of November, the head of Hydro told Quebec lawmakers that the public utility's objective is to reduce power outages by 35% over the next 10 years. It plans to invest over $50 billion to prevent them through maintenance work. But will that be enough? Only time will tell. <laughs> Well, good evening, everyone. Hopefully you're staying dry, and that is hard to do if you venture outside even for a few minutes. Check out our pinpoint radar. So Over right the before the flooding event, water temperatures were anywhere from 3 to 7 degrees Celsius above average for that time of year. Warmer water, more uh, moisture in the atmosphere, and it can lead to some big flood events like we saw this summer. And then you just wait. You wait for social media. You wait for the reporters to get out there and see some of the video. And the flooding is not something that I had ever seen before. Like the idea that a parking lot for a mall became so submerged that a boat was needed to go take people out of that mall and bring them to safety it was just so shocking to me.
there's one shot in particular of just the cars alongside um, alongside the road and just it was like a parking lot of just filled with cars and just like the, <laughs> the water to the brim. I originally grew up in Newfoundland and I'm used to a bit of rain but maybe not like that and I don't think a lot of Nova Scotians are as well. There was a ball field. It was completely submerged with water. It looked like a lake and I was getting b-roll and it was so crazy because all I could smell was gasoline and I don't know where it was leaking from but again just that that reminder too of what could be lying underneath the surface of this water. We were told that um, by police that um, the flood waters came so quickly that it swept a couple vehicles off the road. As the days went on, you know, you wonder how long people can survive, um, especially when there's kids involved. We can rebuild roads and bridges and buildings, but we can't bring people back. And the legacy for these floods will be the incredibly tragic uh, loss of life. I think that's important as the role of a journalist is to, you know, always be saying, but what if? What if there had been an alert um, in a timely manner that could have, could have got these folks to safety? So there's a lot of wind, but that also means a lot of water moving, waves, storm surge, all of that's a concern. And Hurricane Lee, we were able to track it for two weeks as it moved off the coast of Africa, through the Atlantic, and then up to uh, the Maritimes. So I was really nervous uh, about potentially its impact given the lead up to the storm because everybody was saying this is like, this is going to hit quite strong. Uh, and it was, you know, very close to being uh, category one. I couldn't believe how much force uh, this hurricane had because when we got out to Eastern Passage, we started seeing these rocks flying up over and they were coming onto the road. Why did you come down here? Well, I just sort of thought it was open kind of thing and maybe I could see the waves. There was a lot of people there just kind of observing and viewing. Um, and it was, it was dangerous and it was shocking, honestly, how many people came out just to sightsee at, at such a dangerous point. It's a wild weather down here. The, tide, the surge is up and everything is tip top high. That's what's happening here today. And uh, like the officer just told me, get out of here and get my truck home. But anyways, and that's what I'm going to do. I, I think it's awesome. It's ah, very, very entertaining for the kids. Uh, just keeping an eye on the road, making sure it doesn't get washed out. We pulled over at one point just to get shots of a lighthouse and then see some of those waves coming in. And the winds alone were blowing us over. And I just watched this giant wave just come over and crash against the side of the road. And all I heard was, we have to get back in the vehicle. We want those cool shots. We want to see uh, what everyone wants to see on their televisions. We want to be able to really show them what is happening real time and balancing that with the fact that we got to make it back. It's definitely a, a sign for what to expect in the future. I'm not saying every year is going to have a trifecta of hurricanes, fires and uh, and floods, but uh, definitely when you're surrounded by ocean water, rising sea levels, uh, warmer temperatures, more energy uh, available in the atmosphere, you're going to end up with more of these storms. And uh, it has been a very busy period, and I do expect that to continue as the Atlantic really shows no signs of, of cool cooling down anytime soon. I think it was a slower summer day. Uh, maybe I was assigned to a fluffier story, but uh, we started seeing these videos on Twitter of shingles flying off of houses. Uh, they were swirling around in the air, and we thought, okay, this could be serious. On several weeks in a row, we saw that the Ottawa Valley was especially susceptible to these storms, and uh, then it's that morning that uh, we start to see the tornado watches come out. We start to look at the radar and the satellite imagery. We were both gunning to get there as quickly as possible, of course, because, you know, tornadoes happen quickly. And he was really putting the pedal to the metal. And so I, uh, I did get a little woozy. Uh, all of a sudden, she goes, I hope you don't mind, and put her head between her legs. And <laughs> as we're driving, and it's pouring rain, the windows are all fogging up. And I thought, 
she was going to get sick in the car. So I thought, are you okay? She said, I'll be fine, I'll be fine, just have to keep my head. So the entire drive there, which was 30 minutes, plus she had her head down between her legs. There I had to sit in the back of the trunk and just collect myself before I went to talk to people whose life had fallen apart. So I didn't want to vomit on their front lawn. On this Thursday night, a tornado roars through an Ottawa suburb. Everything started to shake. The damage and the frightening moments for people. Donna, this is just some of the damage of a tornado that ripped through the southern Ottawa suburb of Barhaven earlier this afternoon. So by the time we actually got to the area, it would have been about 40, 45 minutes after the tornado passed through. So you drive around the neighborhood, you notice that, well, it doesn't look too bad. There's a few shingles off a house or a piece of siding, nothing too serious. But as you go in a little deeper, you'll you, know, you turn a corner and you'll see a house without a roof and say, oh, OK, this is this actually happened. Their houses had just been torn apart, their roofs were clean off, their shingles were all over their front lawns. The tornado damaged more than 100 homes, tearing off the sides of houses, smashing windows, and sending shingles into the air. You're never sure if people are going to open up to you in that kind of situation. They've kind of just seen their whole life fall apart. Um, that wasn't the case here. Uh, they, they really did want to open up. We had uh, a gentleman actually opened up his backyard to us. He was like bringing us right in. He said, you know, here's where a tree crashed through my fence and it just narrowly missed all this other stuff in my yard. People really wanted to share their stories with us, I think because they wanted us to bear witness to what they'd been through. The entire roof is gone, just rafters are left. Uh, all the insulation was, you know, ripped out of there. It was very scattershot. Some pretty significant damage, other ones who might just be a door or two down the road. Nothing. It was just a very crazy storm that way. This guy came up to us and said, you should go behind this row of houses. So we went uh, sort of behind uh, where the subdivision was. There was like a little hiking trail. You go to the right and it's just debris everywhere, all kinds of stuff. And there was a piece of wood that had gone clean through a fence. And it was roughly the height I was. And I remember thinking like that is where my head could have been. Had anyone been walking on that trail, they would have definitely gotten knocked out. It wasn't as large as other storms we've seen, but it was sudden, sudden, quick. And the damage was intense in a very concentrated area. One person actually got taken to hospital through the entire thing and they were fine. So. You know, for a tornado hitting uh, the capital city, it could have been a lot worse. Canada's summer of fire sent thousands on the run. Just about six o'clock and you can see the darkness from, from the smoke. That feels horrible because you don't know, you know, if you're going to get burnt out. Entire communities displaced for days, even weeks at a time. The territory has decided to evacuate the entire city of Yellowknife. I think we are out of space here. The federal government estimates that more than 232,000 Canadians were forced from their homes because of extreme weather in 2023. Parents, kids, the sick, the elderly, all racing to safety with no sense of when or if they'd be able to return home. We saw a lot of distress because many people were driving for many hours, like f f like a full day. And they were coming here and you could see on their vehicles all this ash and just their faces were just so distraught. Evacuation orders began in early spring and continued straight through until fall. When the fires reached the Northwest Territories in August, flames threatened the only way out by car. Military planes had to be used to help fly people to safety. It was controlled mayhem. Um, initially, you've got that many people descending on one place. The infrastructure to look after them, both physically and emotionally, isn't quite in place instantaneously. It takes a little bit of time to ramp up. In northern BC and Alberta, dozens of cities and towns had to mobilize quickly to help. They relied on volunteers, but the evacuees themselves stepped up as well. We're all brothers and sisters and we are in a bad situation. There was this gentleman named Abdel who was a taxi driver up in Yellowknife. Abdel just decided that he would pass the time by helping people out, going to places like laundromats. His services offered for free. How do you pay for gas? I do my best, I do my best. Yeah. Through the year, the stories of generosity in the face of disaster were many, even when it put people at odds with the law. 
When fire threatened homes around BC's Shishwap Lake in August, many defied evacuation orders to protect their homes. It meant living without power. When food and fuel became scarce, neighbors stepped in to help. They started just loading up their own boats, taking their own generators, fuel, water. Basically, they weren't taking no for an answer at that point, and, and they were going to, you know, help their, help their neighbors across the lake. Emergency officials warned defying evacuation orders can put wildfire fights at risk, but there was no denying in these kinds of emergencies, emotions run high. Those covering the fires were not immune. When wildfire tore through a Nova Scotia subdivision, Rhonda Brown became a part of the story she was sending reporting teams to. It was a little bit surreal, you know, I had to put my feelings aside about um, what the fate of my house was and um, what was happening to my neighbours. From Halifax to West Kelowna, rural Alberta and up to Yellowknife, not all of those forced to evacuate this year have been able to return home. The people displaced by extreme weather. 2023, a year when tens of thousands of Canadians became climate refugees. Heather Urex West, Global News, Calgary. That is our time for tonight. Thanks for watching. From all of us at Global News, we wish you the best in 2024.